Uh, this is the date. You can find this information on the website of the Institute of Chemistry of the University of Sao Paulo. And you can sign up, um, I guess, starting next week until the end of May. OK, so if you're interested, if you're going to be in Sao Paulo in June, uh, think about uh, visiting the Institute of Chemistry um, for, for an event that has probably a lot, it's very complementary to the, to the subject matter of this course. Okay, so um, at the end of at the end of my last talk, I was I, I talked about uh, protein crystallography, and I just want to quickly uh, talk about a couple of other um, experimental methods to study the structure and dynamics of proteins. One of, uh, one of them is protein NMR. So pro different from crystallography, where the protein is actually in a solid state. Um, in protein NMR, we have the protein in a liquid state, okay? And therefore, it's able to theoretically adopt multiple conformations. Um, and so we're studying the, the, the structure and the behavior of the protein in solution, often at room temperature, okay? Um, and the experiment consists of putting it in a large magnetic field, which is created by these uh, superconducting coils. I have these large uh, pieces of equipment here where the superconducting material is uh, surrounded by, it's in a liquid helium bath maintained at around two to four degrees Kelvin. Okay. Um, so you basically put the sample in a strong static magnetic field, and this creates a difference in the uh, energy levels of um, spin states of the nucleus. And these uh, the magnetic moments will align with will align with the uh, static magnetic field. Okay. Uh, but in, in addition to the static magnetic field that's being applied by the magnet, this particular, the particular um, environment that the atom experiences is, uh, is influenced by local magnetic fields that are, um, that are caused by the electronic structure near, around that nucleus. Um, so that induces that creates other magnetic fields that either add or subtract to the static magnetic fields. So each element of the same kind will experience a slightly different magnetic field depending on its particular electronic um, uh, environment. And therefore, this difference in energy level between the spin states um, will be a little different depending on the, the, the particular electronic environment, OK? So that allows, and this difference in energy level is, is related to what we call alarmer frequency, which is the frequency in which um, the bulk magnetization will process around the um, around the axis of the, of the static magnetic field, OK? Um, so basically, what you, what you can do is you can apply uh, an external magnetic field, a pulse, uh, 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 a pulse of radio frequency, OK, that can create a pulse, a pulsed um, magnetic field in a, in a direction that might be orthogonal or anti-parallel to the applied magnetic field. And that can cause the bulk uh, magnetic field, the, the bulk uh, magnetization of those um, elements to, to be um, 
rotated away from their alignment with the, with the static magnetic field. So they can, be, they can be dislocated at a certain angle. Okay? That can be defined by the length of the pulse and the intensity of the pulse. That's applied using these coils, um, different coils that are, that are near the sample. Okay? And then when, the, when this pulse is turned off, uh, the bulk magnetization will, will try to return to its, uh, to its original equilibrium state, which is in alignment with the static magnetic field. And this, this uh, return to equilibrium okay, um, takes a couple of seconds, depending on the, on the nucleus. Okay? And during that time, this bulk magnetization is precessing around, around this, uh, this vertical axis here, around the z-axis. And that, uh, that precession can be detected by oscillations. That the oscillating magnetic field do, during this precession and this return to equilibrium can be detected by an induced current in these coils. So these coils, the same coils that are used to actually induce the, 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 the pulse are used as receivers to actually detect this oscillating magnetic field that causes an oscillating current in, in these coils. And that's basically the NMR signal that's observed. So this NMR signal is basically the oscillations. It's due to the to the, uh, um, the behavior of a whole bunch of different atoms, okay, nuclei. Um, so it's a superposition of the behavior of all of these different nuclei, okay? And that creates what we call um, the free induction decay here. And this, so, so this is basically a sum of many different frequencies, okay? So then there's a Fourier transform that's converted to give us a spectrum uh, of different frequencies here. Um, and so therefore, for example, we can get, if we're looking at the behavior of the protons, uh, we can get a spectrum where each of these peaks here is basically uh, the signal from one atom or one, one species, one specific atom in the, in the molecule that we're studying. Proteins being very, very large molecules have perhaps hundreds or thousands of hydrogen atoms. So we've got a spectrum here of hundreds of different hydrogen atoms. Okay? Um, not only hydrogen has, a, has an NMR signal, but uh, nitrogen-15 also has an NMR signal. Um, Carbon-13 as well. So you can, you can uh, produce recombinant proteins in bacteria grown in minimal medium that have uh, ammonium chloride in which the nitrogens have been uh, sub substituted, nitrogen 14 has been substituted for nitrogen, nitrogen 15, and glucose in which the, the carbon 12s have been substituted for carbon 13. Um, so you can have, you can, you can actually detect the signals from hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon, okay? So you can do several different experiments where you can correlate the signals of hydrogens and nitrogens. So here, this is, this is a common uh, 2D spectrum where the hydrogen signal is correlated with the nitrogen signal. So what we're seeing here is, is a peak for every hydrogen that's bound to a nitrogen. So in proteins, all the amino acids, each amino acid has one NH group in the backbone. Some amino acids also have side chains with NH groups, okay? So you can get a signal for every NH group in, in the protein. Um, so this is like, almost like a, a, a fingerprint of the protein um, in this kind of experiment. So you can do other experiments where you can look at the, look at the uh, CH groups, the side chains. You can transfer magnetization from one group to, from one nucleus to another, from hydrogen to nitrogen to, to carbon, et cetera, okay? So there are literally dozens of different experiments that you can, that you can do to, that give information about uh, nuclei that are connected to each other, 
okay? And uh, nuclei that are, that are close to each other in space, but not necessarily connected to each other through chemical bonds. So that can give you structural information, okay? So you can do experiments in which, in which you can uh, detect all the hydrogen, for, for example, in this nosy experiment, you can detect all of the hydrogen atoms that are within five angstroms to any other hydrogen atom, okay? Um, so, for example, here we have a hydrogen atom with a signal here that is close to all of these different hydrogen atoms, okay? So this kind of information can be used. You can do experiments where you can walk through the protein and identify, assign each signal to a specific atom in the protein. So essentially, after you've done these experiments, you've got a specific signal for every single atom in the protein. All the hydrogens, all the carbons, and all of the nitrogens, okay? And then you can, once you've got that assignment, then you can do other experiments to look to find the neighbors of these atoms, to see how the dynamics of these, of these atoms, okay? Um, so, for example, in, in, a, in, a, in, in order to determine the structure, this kind of experiment allows you to say that this, this amino acid is close to this amino acid because a hydrogen atom in that amino acid was within, within five angstroms of a hydrogen in the other amino acid, even though these two amino acids are very far away from each other in the sequence. So you can basically have a, get a table of dozens or hundreds of uh, geometrical constraints, okay? And this allows you to select models that are consistent with these geometric restraints. So you can get information about, about distances. You can also do other experiments, which are these uh, uh, J-coupling experiments that gives you information about um, rotation angles in the, in the, in the backbone. Uh, residual dipolar couplings gives you information about the orient the vectors, the orientations of certain bonds in relation to the the, vec the, the, the static magnetic field. And that, that can all be used to give you structural information to make a model of the protein. So you can get, if you have enough constraints, if you have enough information here, you can basically uh, build mo all of the models that are consistent with all of the information. They all fa fall into a family of structures, which are represented here. So instead of getting one structure, like in crystallography, usually in crystallography you deposit one structure, which is the best model that was consistent with that electron density map. In NMR, you deposit usually 10 or 20 or 50 structures, all of which are consistent with all of these geometrical restraints that you have uh, obtained, that you have collected during, in, in several different kinds of experiments, okay? Um, so, so this is like a, an example of an NMR structure of a heme, of a heme binding protein. Um, you can see that there are certain, certain regions of the backbone which all of the models are basically exactly the same. So this is a very, very well-determined region. So this, this, this is basically telling us that this part of, this, of, the, of the protein is not very flexible. Whereas in this, this loop here, for example, you can see that the, each model is a little different, okay? And that is telling us that this region of the protein is probably conformationally flexible, okay? So it's, it's dynamic. Um, this is another structure of a protein where you can see that this is the end, the amino terminus is here, the C terminus is here. So you can see that the first 40 or 50 amino acids in all of the models are totally different. So it's basically saying that this region of the protein is completely uh, in, intrinsically disordered, okay? Then we have a domain here that is highly, it's very well structured. And then we have a C-terminal domain that's around 10 amino acids that is also disordered, okay? So this is the superposition of just this globular domain here where you can see that all of the models are almost exactly the same. So this is a very, very well-ordered, well-behaved um, uh, globular domain. And then we have uh, an amino terminus and a C-terminus that are very unstructured, okay? If you in this case, the crystal structure of this domain was also determined. 
at high, at high resolution. And if you superpose them, the NMR structure and the crystal structure are almost exactly the same. So that question, that's, that the question about whether, um, whether the, the, crystal, the crystallization causes, introduces uh, deformations in the structure, um, in general, that's not true. But, for example, this protein, it was imposs it's impossible to crystallize this protein, the full-length protein. Why? Because the full-length protein has these, these uh, flexible regions that, in, that, that interfere with the crystallization process. It's every pro essentially, essentially, every molecule in your solution has a different conformation. And that doesn't, that's not very conducive to, to, to crystallization. Okay? So what you had to do was we had to clip this off and this off here and just produce this, this region of the protein. And then that crystallized very well. And when we compared the crystal structure with the NMR structure, they're basically identical. Okay? But NMR can, can give you other information okay, that might not be that useful, uh, not, might, not that, might not be that easy to obtain from crystallography, for example, you can look at, an, at one protein, in this case, VIRB9, okay, this is, this is a, a system that we're studying, I'm not gonna talk about exactly what's going on here, but basically we're looking at the blue molecule um, whose NMR spectrum is in green, okay, uh, on its own, and then when we add the purple molecule, when we add this, this purple molecule here, which is, uh, the green molecule's spectrum turns to the red spectrum. So you can see that the structure of the green molecule on its own, okay, and in the presence of this purple domain here is totally different. In fact, uh, on its own, this molecule is sort of like a molten globule. It's not very well folded. And then when, when we add this peptide here, that induces this protein to be very well folded, okay? And then if we do the opposite experiment, where we add, um, where we add VRB7, which is the purple molecule, actually what we're doing here is we're adding, we're adding the whole molecule actually. So we're adding this whole molecule here, this whole molecule here. We have the NMR spectrum of it. And then we add this blue molecule, which is VRB9. Um, and we see that some, so in, in red, we see in, or, sorry, in orange, we see several of the peaks in orange move, move drastically in the NM, they, they change their, uh, their chemical shifts, their, their, their frequencies um, in, in the spectrum drastically, okay? And if we map the positions of these amino acids whose chemical shifts changed, okay, they all map to this amino terminus. So that, that region that was unstructured in the full length protein, now we know that in fact, it's it, it is the site of interaction with its partner, with VIRB7's partner, which is called VIRB9, okay? So that, that allowed, allowed us to map the interaction site of this protein with another protein in a, in a larger complex, okay? NMR also allows you to measure solvent exposure of specific atoms. So you can take a, a, a protein sample and put that protein sample in deuterated water. And then so the hydrogen, the, the labile hydrogen atoms in the amino groups will exchange with water. So the hydrogens will exchange for deuteriums and deuterium in these experiments is invisible. So what you can see is you can see a, 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 over time, you can see that there's a disappearance of many peaks, okay? Because those, the signals of those hydrogen atoms are being exchanged for, for, uh, for deuterium. But you can see that some of, some of the peaks are lost within a couple of minutes, okay? And then others persist for many, many hours, or actually two days here, or actually here there's five days, there's still a couple of peaks. So that's, telling, that's giving us information about uh, the stability of certain hydrogen bonds. So if hydrogen bonds are being 
may, are, if they have a lifetime that's many, many hours or days even, that's telling us that those, those uh, interactions are very, very stable. Whereas other hydrogen bonds that are exchanged within a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, okay, are probably solvent exposed. So you can get structural information, you can get information about the stability of certain interactions, intramolecular interactions from these experiments. So you can see here, this is a different protein. You can see here uh, the, life, the, 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 the lifetimes of the persistence of the signals. Here you can see this oscillation, uh, very stable, unstable, very stable, unstable, very stable, unstable. Okay? That has to do with this alternating pattern of hydrogen bonds. So you have a hydrogen bond, if it's at the edge of a, of a beta sheet, You'll have a hydrogen bond that's exposed to the solvent, then it's buried and making a hydrogen bond, so it's stable. And then this is exposed, and then this is stable, et cetera, okay? So you can get that kind of information from these experiments, okay? And then I wanted to talk, I wanted to talk about a third. Anyone, any have, anyone have questions about NMR in general? No? Okay, so. Depends on what you want to do. If you want to get just the structure, and if you have an idea as to whether there are, and if you have a good idea that certain regions are well folded, um, then I would try and crystallize it because it's relatively faster if you're able to crystallize it. And it but if you want to look at interactions between that protein and another protein, or you want to look at dynamics of certain regions, um, then you can do NMR. Uh, NMR has some, some uh, disadvantages that above 20 or 30 kilodaltons, or above 20, 200 or 300 amino acids, the NMR, sig the NMR, first the NMR signals start to get weaker. For each peak, they get, they, they get spread out. Um, so the, the, the quality of the spectra is reduced, and also the spectra are more complex because you have just more, more signals in the, same, in the same square or, or in the same spectrum. So the interpretation gets to be more difficult. Um, there are ways to get around that, but th these are co much more complex experiments, much more expensive, much more time consuming, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So. Cryoelectron microscopy is another, it's another uh, uh, technique that in the last five or ten years has exploded in, in, in the area of structural biology. So it basically consists of putting, an elect, uh, putting a sample on a grid, on a copper grid. Um, it's covered with carbon often. In, inside an electron microscope, uh, passing an electron beam through the sample, and you have uh, a detector here at the bottom. Um, so, over the past several years, the quality of these electron microscopes has improved dramatically. Um, the detectors have improved very much dramatically, so now we have what we call direct electron detectors that um, their resolution um, is highly improved, and they're much more stable, so, and also they're, they're much faster. So instead of collecting an image, over a couple of seconds. So during the exposition of the sample, the exposure of the sample to the electron beam, the sample absorbs energy and it heats up and it moves around. Okay? You might think that it doesn't move around that much, but it does move around during the time of the exposition. And that, that reduces, that limits the, the resolution of the image. It's like you're taking a picture of somebody, and if he's moving around a lot, it's going to be a blurry image. Okay? The, so, but now the detectors are so fast that they can take literally hundreds of images per second. Okay? And therefore, instead of taking one image, you can, take, you can make a film of the images. And then what you can do is you can take the, the, each frame of the, of the film and align them. So it's as if I took a picture of you moving, 
but then I took each frame and then and I, if I had if I took if I took the picture of you moving in one image, it would be blurry. But then if I, if I could split that up into 60 different or 30 different frames and take each one of them and align them, I could get a much higher resolution image of you. Okay? So your movement during the, 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 during the exposure can be reduced. Okay? And this has improved dramatically the quality of these images. Okay. And so now we have these microscopes that are very, very expensive, they're very, very complex, cost like five million dollars. Uh, the only ones in South America, there's one in, in Campinas, basically. Actually, there's two. There's these two here in Campinas. Okay. This one's like five million dollars, and this one's, I don't know, one and a half million dollars or something like that. You, just the detectors alone are like a million dollars. So it's not, it's not like something you can have just in your in your home lab, unless you're from like Germany or something like that where they have dozens of them apparently. Um, so anyway, so basically what you do is you, instead you have like movie frames, instead of individual images, you have movie frames, you stack them up and you align them and then you see particles and you pick the particles and you try and align the particles and then aligning hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of particles even though each particle's image is very, very low uh, signal to noise, if you're aligning thousands and thousands of particles, then you can actually get an image. And if the particles are all the same, that's assuming that we, they're all the same conformation, that there is not, there's not very much uh, conformational flexibility, um, then you can get a very, very high resolution three-dimensional map of the, of the molecule that you're studying. And this, 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 uh, this method is particularly good for large particles because they have higher contrast so they can be identified more easily. Okay? So there, it's very, very good for like complexes, you know, like organ, um, you know, new, uh, um, ribosomes or, or you know, uh, pro, you know multi-protein complexes, viruses, et cetera. Okay. So this is just based, this is, uh, I'm going to go through this here quickly. So you can see here you've got a whole bunch of different particles. So here, this, this, this uh, complex here of three different proteins repeated 14 times is purified from a, from a cell, from a bacterial membrane fraction. And you can see the particles here in different orientations, okay? Um, and you can, if you, if you get uh, over 100,000 of these images, um, this allowed you to make a very, very high resolution map where you can actually see the side chains of, of, of amino acids. So the resolution here is uh, around three, three and a half angstrom resolution. Okay? Um, you can actually make what they call a resolution map so you can see different regions. Regions in blue, the resolution is higher. It's around between 3 and 3.2 angstroms. In green, it's around 3.5 angstroms. In red, it's above 4 angstroms resolution. So you can see that the different regions of the, of the molecule have uh, greater or less resolution. The quality of the map for those regions is greater or lower. Okay? So here I just wanted to show a three-minute video, which I prepared here. That shows this the process of this uh, electron micro of of sample preparation and and and, and detection. This is from the Gabriel Lambert, uh, Lander lab. So you have your sample in in solution. It's in water, okay. And so what you do is each molecule is in a different conf different orientation in the wa water. It's Brownian motion, okay. Um, and then because in an electron microscope, you have to freeze, you have, it's in a vacuum, you have to freeze the sample first. So here, that's your, that's your uh, electron microscope grid. You put a couple of microliters of your solution on the grid. And then you bring it to what they call a, a cryobot or a vitrobot, okay? Which is basically a very, very, very expensive tweezer holder with like these two, they look like earphones, but it's really filter paper. And you put you, 
you, you basically press the filter paper on the sample for a couple of seconds, and then immediately plunge the sample into a little, an ethane, a liquid ethane bath that freezes the sample so quickly that it can't produce ice crystals. And each molecule is basically frozen in a different orientation. So even though it's frozen, it's almost like an NMR experiment. Each molecule is in a different conformation. So now, so you take, so, you, so now you bring that to the electron microscope, keeping it frozen all the time, and you take an image. And here you have an, a detector, okay? In the old days it was photographic film, but now it's uh, these direct electron detectors, okay? And so what you do is you have a three-dimensional object that basically you get a projection of that object, like an X-ray basically, uh, in two dimensions. So here you have, you, have this, you have these molecules that are in different orientations. You can see that their projections are different, okay? So what you can do is you can try and select orientations that look the same, okay? So these, all of these orientations look the same. They've been selected, so they can, be, they can be rotated to be in the same orientation and then superposed. Okay, so, so you, or, you rotate them and then you superpose them, and that gives you a high resolution projection of, in one orientation. Okay, and then you do that for molecules that have different orientations. Okay, so now you get high resolution, high resolution. Um, projections from different orientations, and then you combine them to make a 3D reconstruction of the molecule. So what you have is a 3D construction of the electron density. So again, it's an electron density map, and now you have to construct a model that's consistent with this map, okay? If it's high enough resolution, as it's getting to be these days, you can actually see the, you can actually see the, uh, the amino acid side chains and walk through the protein just like a crystal electron density map. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay, so this has created this, these, these uh, enorm these uh, big uh, advances in microscope hardware, sample preparation, uh, software to analyze the data. Um, and the direct electron detectors has created what they call this resolution revolution, okay? And uh, so now we're getting, we're getting uh, dozens or hundreds of structures being produced every year uh, at, ato at quote unquote atomic resolution. So you, atomic resolution, it's not really atomic resolution, it's molecular resolution. You can see the side chains, you can identify aromatic side chains, et cetera, okay? Um, the, core, the best, the best uh, uh, highest resolution structures, uh, I think, as of today, is I think there have been some that are close to or even better than two angstroms. Okay? And here is just like uh, the number of map depositions in the electron microscopy database as a function of time and resolution. So this is the years here. This is going up to 2017. 2016, and you can see that the, the number that's being deposited every year in blue is increasing, okay? And the total number is increasing exponentially. And the quality, the, the resolution, the number of structures that are being deposited with resolution below four angstroms, okay, where you can actually start seeing secondary structure and, and, and side chains, uh, is also increasing. So in 2016, there were 200. That, that number's probably at least doubled or tripled in the last couple of years, definitely. Okay? And, and there's also, now this kind of methodology is being used uh, uh, to look at whole cells, okay, or organelles within the cell. So now instead of purifying a protein or a protein complex, you can freeze you can plunge freeze a cell and try and detect, detect uh, certain protein complexes in the cell. That can be very hard because the cell is jam-packed with a whole bunch of different, different molecules. But 
um, then you can then what you can do is instead of instead of looking at hundreds or thousands of cells, you can look at one cell, identify the complex that you're trying to study in the cell, okay, and then tilt tilt the cell, do what they call a tilt series, and obtain different images at different angles, and then you can recon, you can uh, combine these these images that were obtained in different tilts at different angles, you can combine them to make a three-dimensional image. And you can do that with multiple samples, okay? Um, and then combine these three-dimensional images um, to get a higher resolution image. Now, this, this technology is still limited. Um, it's still, still not able to give high resolution, atomic resolution structures, okay? So this is an example of what they call a type 4 secretion system from Legionella, okay? You can see here, if you squint your eyes, uh, you can see these complexes in the cell membrane that they cross the inner membrane, the periplasm, and the outer membrane. So you have several of these complexes, and there was tomography performed on them. So you get this kind of, this kind of image here, okay? A side view, the top view, and you can get this kind of Reconstruction. It's obviously not high resolution, okay? But the promise is that perhaps with advances in technology over the next decade or so that this, this kind of approach will, will be able to give us high resolution data of molecules inside a cell, okay? So jumping very quickly, uh, so just comparing these... Um, these three techniques that I, that, I, that I talked about. Crystallography, they have advantages and disadvantages. Crystallography has the advantage of being high resolution. There's no theoretical limit as to the size of the, of the molecules. The disadvantage that it's not applicable to highly flexible proteins. Highly flexible proteins will just, just won't crystallize. So what you, have, you might have to do is, uh, by recombinant methods, delete, the, the, delete the, uh, the flexible regions and determine the structure of just a specific domain or, or, or domains that are not conformationally flexible. Um, it's difficult to study kinetics and dynamics, and it's limited by your ability to crystallize the protein, which is, not often, it's, which is often not trivial. Okay? NMR, it's advantage that it's applicable to small proteins. It gives you it gives you information about conformational dynamics and, free, and with different frequencies from nanosecond time scale to, to seconds, okay? Um, it can be used to study the kinetics of molecular interactions and protein folding. Its main disadvantage is that it can't be applied, or it's very difficult to apply to large proteins. So above 20 or 30 kilodaltons, it starts to get comp complicated. Cryo-EM has the advantage of you don't have to crystallize it, you have to, it's good, good to study large macromolecular complexes. It can study multiple conformational states. I didn't mention, so you can, you can theoretically have a protein in more than one conformation, and, and you can, if you're, if you're able to, do, when you're doing the, the, the classification of the different structures, uh, you can separate molecules in one conformation from a molecule in another conformation. So in the same sample, you could perhaps obtain two or more different structures of different conformational states. Now, that, that depends on your ability to actually distinguish these conformational states. Um, but in theory, it, it, should, it, it could give you that kind of information. Its disadvantage is a lower, limit, lower size limit. Small proteins are difficult to see in the electron micrographs, so it's hard to see it in, uh, in, uh, with respect to the, to the, to the, to the background. Um, they, because they have low contrast. Uh, it, doesn't, it still doesn't have as high resolution as crystallography, but it's improving. And uh, very, very large data sets. Data sets are terabyte data sets because you're collecting dozens of images of hundreds of thousands of, or tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of particles. Uh, often you're... you're, you're Often you're, get, you're collecting hundreds or thousands of different images. Each image has, could have dozens or hundreds of particles. So uh, 
So the, the, the size of the data sets are very large. Okay. Um, and I, I, I think was sent to you by email uh, a message in which um, I gave you some exercises for people that there might be half of you here that have already seen all this before, so they're, they're not that interested in doing it. But some people that might not be interested, that might not uh, have been exposed to this, uh, to the, to um, tools on the web that uh, are there to help people study, uh, to analyze proteins, protein sequences, and protein structures. Okay, so uh, basically, you know, you can choose, there's an exercise at the end, you can choose a protein, try and edit, find its gene, um, try and get its sequence, its amino acid sequence, analyze its you know, amino acid sequence, number of amino acids, its molecular weight, its uh, isoelectric point, predict its secondary structure, uh, find domains in the protein, uh, find homologs. Homologs are proteins that have sequences that are very similar to the protein that you're studying. Um, try and uh, see if the three-dimensional structure of the protein is found in the databases of, of that protein or of its homologs. Uh, analyze the structure. Uh, align the sequences of the homologs. So if you align the sequences of homologs, or of proteins that are of the same family, okay, that have sequence similarity, you can detect regions of the sequence that are more conserved than others. And that conservation is often an indication of the importance in the function. Okay? Um, so you can align the sequences and you can get, you can identify the conserved, re conserved residues and you can look at phylogeny. Okay? Um, so this information, this comparison of homologue can give you information about evolution. Okay? Um, so yeah, so these are these are sites, these are sites that are that, that are that are mentioned up here. And here's a little exercise for people that are interested in doing this kind of thing. Okay? Um, and then so that's the end of part two. That's where I should have ended at lunch. And now I have 10 minutes to talk about uh, part three, so I'm going to jump through really, really fast here. So, uh, Fernando, you can stop me whenever you want. Um, so, I was going to just give a, a last talk about, you know, some curious um, uh, aspects of, uh, of proteins, okay? The number of structures known, the classification of protein families, protein domains, and some examples of protein function. I probably won't be able to get very far in this. So this is basically showing, again, the accumulation of protein structures deposited in the databases. So you can see the total number of structures is like uh, 160,000 or something like that. Over 160,000 structures deposited in the PDB. Uh, and it's the current rate is around 11,000 deposits per year. So you can see that of the total, the vast majority is X-ray, okay? Um, and you can, but you can see the number of NMR. The number of NMR isn't growing that much. Uh, the, number, the number of cryo-EM is growing a little, maybe it's, the rate of growth is a little greater, but it's still less than NMR, okay? Um, so structures deposited each year by method. So here's, this is yearly deposit. This is the total. This is a yearly deposit. You can see that the, the X-ray structure rate is basically constant over the last 20 years. The rate of NMR, actually, no, it's the rate of, no, the rate isn't constant. It's growing. It's growing every year, okay? It's growing every year, but its, it's acceleration is not increasing. So it's growing at, 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 this, at, a, at a constant. Its rate of acceleration, it's, its rate of growth of growth is, 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 uh, is constant. Uh, NMR is basically the same number of de uh, structures deposited every year. Uh, Cryo-EM, you can see that it's actually increasing. So the second derivative of this, cur of this curve is, is, is not zero, okay? So, um, 
In general, approximately 30% of the genes of a protein code uh, uh, for proteins code for proteins with unknown function. So that's even still, still, uh, still true today. Okay, uh, half of these proteins may belong to well-defined protein sequence families, and the other half may may have very few or known or or no known homologs. So still, when we sequence the genome of an organism, especially organisms whose, who have not, whose, uh, um, that are very different from the other organisms that have been sequenced, um, we often find many, many proteins that are, whose sequences are, so, are, are not similar to any other proteins sequenced um, uh, that are found in the, in the databases. Okay? So there's a, lot, there's a large uh, interest in trying to classify these proteins uh, in terms of their structure, okay? And there's a couple of databases that, have, that are sort of dedicated to this. One of them is called CAF, okay? Protein Structure Ca Classification Database. Um, and it has like four, four hierarchies. It's a hierarchical system uh, where it classifies proteins in terms of class, architecture, topology, and homologous superfamily. So classes are basically classifying the proteins in terms of the predominant secondary structures found in, in, the, in, in, the, in the 3D structure. So they can be all alpha sheet, all alpha helix, all beta sheet, uh, a mixture of alpha helices and beta sheets, or, or structures that have few secondary structures. Okay? And then you have the second level, which is called architecture, which basically tries and classifies the proteins according to the organization of these secondary structures in the three-dimensional um, globular uh, structure, okay, without, without taking into consideration the connectivity between the secondary structures. So you can have two alpha hel or three, four alpha helices like this, uh, if we ignore how these alpha helices are connected, they're, on this, they're in the same architecture. Okay? Uh, and then we have the third level is called topology or the fold group, okay? which takes into consideration the connectivity. Okay? So here we have a sandwich architecture, but we have two different topologies because these beta sheets and alpha helices here are connected in different ways, even though they're organized, if you ignore the loops that connect them, they're organized in the same, in the same manner in this family, in this, in this topology, in this topology. So they have the same architecture, but they have a different topology, okay? And then we have the homologous superfamily, which is basically, uh, it groups together protein domains that have sequences that are similar to each other. Okay? And that indicates that they have a common, a common ancestor, um, and therefore they're, they're considered homologous. Okay? And there's several different ways, that, there's cer certain um, features that you have to keep in mind when you're, when you're defining a, su a homologous superfamily. Okay? And then you have these other sub subcategories that I don't have time to get into. Okay? So in the CAF database at the moment, there are... Six, over 6,000 homologous superfamilies. Um, and around 1,400 topologies. And this number, 1,400, hasn't really increased over the f last five or 10 years. Okay? It's growing very, very slowly. So almost every structure that is, that's, that's being determined, even though it might be a sequence that's never been seen before. When we look at the, at the topology, it often has a topology similar to a structure that's already deposited in the databases. So the number of topologies for domains in proteins might be actually limited to you know, a number that's less than 2,000, say. Okay, maybe. Or maybe we discover a whole new region of Conformational space in proteins, maybe in the future, that uh, that had never been uh, realized before. But that that seems to be unlikely. This number here hasn't been increasing that much before. 
even though this number is going up. Okay? And there's another, there's another database called SCOP, which is a structural classification of, protein, of proteins database that does sort of the same thing. Um, so this is, this is a diagram that's just basically saying if you have a, of a super family of homologs, okay, of a couple of dozen of proteins that, that can all be sort of shown to be homologous, you can align them and they have some certain sequence similarity, um, you, can, you can sort of like put them in this Venn diagram that proteins within these small blue circles have greater than 50% sequence identity. And then proteins in these red circles have greater than 30% sequence identity. And proteins in this, with all of the proteins together, all of them are at least 20% identical with all the others. Okay? So, what does that mean in terms of structure? So that means, like, does that mean that if I determine the structure of any one of these proteins, all of the other proteins have the same structure? Uh, probably not. Okay? So... If you look here, this is, a, this is a diagram of the root mean square difference of the, the carbon alpha positions in angstroms when you superpose proteins that have from 0 to 90%. So if you have identity, root mean square between positions of, of, of aligned amino acids is very low, and therefore they probably have the very, very, very similar structures. But once you go below 35% sequence identity, the root mean square difference in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the positions of the amino acids starts to increase a lot. Okay? So below 30, 35% sequence identity, using the structure of one protein to, in, to infer the structure of another protein is very, very risky. Okay? So this is an example of this kind of thing. You have two different proteins, two proteins that are in this, in what they call the pill Z fam super family, okay? They have, I think, around 20, 25% sequence identity. Uh, but you can see that the folds are simil very similar in, in general, but they have some significant differences. Here, there's, a, there's two, this, this uh, Amino terminal beta strand is in the opposite direction from this amino terminal beta strand. This one has an extra beta strand here, which in this case is an alpha helix. And this, this protein here binds a, a, a cyclic dinucleotide, whereas this protein doesn't. Okay? So even though they're in the same super family, you can see that they have similar, they have similarities in sequence, but there are regions that are different. Okay? So you have to keep that in mind. And then another layer of complexity is that protein domains can be shuffled around during evolution to create proteins with different functions. So, for example, uh, you can have what they call these histidine kinase domains, GGDEF domains, triple A type ATPase domains, etc. Uh, they can be in combination with other domains. Okay, so in the protein, if you determine the structure of the protein, you'll probably find that this is a globular region and it's connected by some kind of linker or something to another region that's globular. Okay? Um, and you can see that these... So, so, so different proteins with different domains, they can be combined with other domains to make proteins with different functions. Okay? So this is an example of one bacteria that has around 30 proteins that all have these GGDEF domains, which are uh, diguanylate cyclase domains, okay? Um, but you can see that these diguanylate cyclase domains are found in combination with a whole bunch of different other domains to probably produce proteins with different, different specific physiological functions, okay? Um, yeah, so new combinations of domains may lead to proteins with new functions. Um, like I said, protein, I, I, a corollary to, to, to what I said before, that proteins with sequences that are marginally similar might have different structures. It's also true that proteins that have no sequence similarity whatsoever might adopt the same fold. Okay, in fact, that's what's being found. Uh, like I said, the number of folds 
in the databases hasn't increased significantly over the last five or ten years. Okay, that's even though we're get we're we're determining the structures of proteins in in divergent sequence families, superfamilies. Okay, that's why uh, that's that's basically saying the proteins with no recognizable sequence similarities may adopt similar folds. Okay, so making hypotheses based solely on, structure, on structural or bioinformatics analysis without functional data is a risky business, okay? Um, so yeah, so then I was gonna spend some time talking about some interesting, important um, uh, 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 proteins um, in biology, but I don't have time to do that because it's already six o'clock. So I'll just pass through these really quickly here. I was going to talk about membrane, membrane, pro, membrane proteins, uh, modeling the dynamics of uh, biological membranes, which is very, very important. This is a big challenge in, in, in uh, molecular simulations of biological systems. Uh, that was that I told you about the, the, uh, the quality control of protein folding. So proteins that are, 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 are misfolded or proteins that, that who, who, who's, who now are, are sentenced to be degraded in eukaryotic cells, they're often tagged by these small proteins, a small protein, multiple copies of a small protein called ubiquitin. And depending on where it's bound to the, to the, to the target protein, it has different, different fates, one of which is it's, it's uh, targeting to uh, the proteosome, which is a big garbage disposal protein. It's a, basically a huge protease and this protein is now inserted into this proteasome and it's degraded into its component amino acids, okay? This is proteins that are involved in DNA repair, DNA photolyase and RAD51, which are just two different proteins involved in maintaining the integrity of the genetic material. When there are uh, mutations, uh, photolyase um, breaks up, uh, it resolves it detects and deletes um, damaged bases that have been covalently, uh, that have suffered a chemical reaction due to exposure, usually to ultraviolet radiation. Um, so it will detect these, these, these modified bases and uh, repair them. RAD51 will, will repair double-stranded breaks in the DNA, so this is very, very important. Um, uh, but maintaining the, the integrity of, of your chromosomes, okay? And here I was going to talk about muscle contraction, which is mediated by this uh, myosin ATPase that interacts with uh, actin filaments. And I was going to talk about conformational changes coupled to chemical reactions, which is a very, very important thing in, in, uh, in protein function. The hydrolysis or the chemical reactions will often, uh, the energy liberated from a chemical reaction can, can be used to drive different processes. Some of them can be actually associated with a generation of force, movement, or tension. Um, and the transport of material within the cell or muscle contraction, for example, in this case. So I was going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and this, yeah. Uh, and myosin, actually, the myosin in the muscle is just one of a super family of myosin molecules. There's actually over 20 of them. Like our, our genome codes for around 20 different myosins with different functions in the cell, only one of which is involved in muscle contraction. The other ones are involved in like transport of organelles in our cells, in hearing, um, et cetera. Okay, so you can have a mutation in muscle, in, in a myosin gene that doesn't affect your muscles, but it, you, you go deaf because of it, okay? Um, and there's other, these other motors, kinesin and dynein. Uh, dine I saw that there are some posters upstairs on some people working on kinesin, so you can probably talk to them about it. Uh, these are motors that walk along microtubules in different, in, in opposite directions. And also channels that transport Molecules across membranes often against, against a concentration gradient. And how do they do this? They couple the release of energy of some other kind of reaction, 
could be hydrolysis of ATP. It could be the co-transport of another solute in the direction of the, of the gradient. Um, and this is used to maintain, um, uh, to maintain uh, voltage and concentration gradients across cell membranes. OK, so that's it. Um, I'm going to be here. Well, if people are interested, I will be here on Saturday. Um, and I'll be here for the next half hour if people want to talk about, to, about anything that I, that I uh, presented this afternoon. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Question. Why Swiss prot is not there? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry. I should have put it there. Yeah, I don't use it that much. I use uh, PFAM and I do my alignments on my own and stuff. But yeah, I should, I should include Swiss prot and yeah, I should. Yes, Moses. Yes. Since you showed several molar proteins yes. at the end, yes. uh, the comment is that in that case, besides structure, yes. when those now, how they work, yes. And yes. that is connected to the previous thought, because they are Brownian ratchets um. that are driven by Brownian motion. Brownian ratchets that are driven by Brownian motion. But it's not only that. There is a sort of there is a sort of a coupling of the hydrolysis yeah. of the hydrolysis the the, the, AT, the the binding of the nucleotide of ATP its hydrolysis and its release changes its changes its conformation and changes its affinity for actin. Exactly. The yes. conformation change, yes. which is the crucial step, is a thermal ratchet. That's it. Okay. It's Brownian motion that does that. Okay. Without Brownian motion, there would be no life. Exactly. Absolutely. But the but the hydro correct me if I'm wrong, but the hydrolysis of the nucleotide and its release of the products of the ADP and the and the and the phosphate, uh, inorganic phosphate changes the conformation. So it, it, it changes the equilibrium between conformational states. So before the hydrolysis, one state was favored, even though it's in equilibrium. And then you hydrolyze, and that changes the equilibrium. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What is solid state NMR? Uh, I'm. Yeah. Um, solid state NMR um, basically uh, is used to to look at samples um, that are sort of like fixed. They're not in solution. Um, they're 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 conformationally fixed. And then you and it's you have to use a different kind of equipment, um, and you have to. And I can't really get into the details of that because I really don't know it very well. Um, but it's it's also not a technique that is very very widespread. Okay, there are a few good labs in the world that are working on this, but it's not that it's not that disseminated. Um, why is NMR? Why is NM? Why do you have this upper li this upper limit of the size for NMR? Well, two things. Two, the major things are, as you increase the size, the number of signals, the number of peaks increases, and so you get a lot of overlap. So your ability to distinguish which two different peaks uh, uh, gets more and more difficult. And each of the peaks, instead of being a high thin peak for specific reasons, 
it becomes sort of a, sh uh, a low, shallow peak. They sort of spread out. So your, the, the ability to actually detect the peak just by itself goes down. Dinner time, study time, right? Study time. I guess. 